Yes, so a growing strain, um, so basically any sort of muscle strain is basically a tear in the muscle. So it can be a very small minor tear, only a few fibers torn with a little bit of bleeding, or it can be quite a big tear with significant number of fibers torn and a lot of bleeding. Um, but generally speaking, um, a strain in the groin area tends to affect a muscle called the adductor longus, which is a, a complex of muscles that basically help bring the leg across the body and in towards the body. Um, and we sort of see this in twisting, um, running, sharp change of direction activities. Um, and generally speaking, you'll get uh, quite a sharp pain. So it's quite an acute injury. It's quite obvious that you've got uh, some pain there and generally makes you stop the activity that you're doing. So the question is whether this can be um, mistaken for a hernia. So a hernia in the sense that we're speaking about today is more called a sports hernia sportsman's hernia or the sportsman's groin, lots of different names for it. And basically this involves not a true hernia in the sense that there's a defect in the wall of the muscle and the contents are pushing through the defect. But in this sense, it's more a weakness and it's a weakness in the posterior inguinal wall. So the inguinal wall is, a, is, is an area of the groin, which is a little bit higher up, so lower abdomen um, and sort of top of the groin area. And uh, the inguinal area is basically made up of the wall of the muscles of the abdomen. And weakness in the posterior wall of this can cause a sort of constant irritation of contents that run through that canal. Uh, and those contents include blood vessels uh, in men's spermatic cord and also nerves that supply the area of the groin. So that constant irritation from that weakness, especially of the nerves, can then result in pain. And that pain can be, it can be quite pinpoint, but it can also be quite diffuse. Um, so the pain can be in that area of the inguinal region but it can also be in the area of the uh, adductor area. So there's some crossover there with the um, signs of the strain. The pain can also be in the testicles in, in men and also under the testicles and also in the area that we call the pubic uh, symphysis and the pubic region. So there's a lot of crossover of symptoms between the two. And this is why um, it does need a little bit of further sort of investigation and discussion to pick out whether there is a strain or whether there's a hernia, sports hernia, or whether there's a combination of both because pathologies can definitely coexist. And in my experience, I see this a lot where it's not just one, there's multiple pathologies around the hip and the groin. So, it's very important to pick out exactly what's the pain generator and treat that first and foremost. Because the other thing that we see with this is that often it's a continuum. So you can have a groin strain or even um, what we call tendinopathy. So where the muscle attaches to the bone, the tendon, there can be a pathology of that area. And that can mimic uh, signs of a hernia, but can also be present with uh, an inguinal hernia. Um, and that weakness and imbalance of the muscles can present in different ways. But the underlying issue is that there's, um, there's a problem within the area as a whole. Um, yeah, so I think that sort of covers the, 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 two, the two, uh, two injuries and how they can overlap and be mistaken for one another. Um, so, it, again, in my experience, we're talking general terms, but there can always be overlap. But generally speaking, a, a strain tends to be more acute and happens uh, sort of, it, it, there's an incident and you're aware of it and 
Um, often it stops you playing that activity or continuing with that activity, uh, and it's a sharp pain. So it's quite an acute, uh, specific incident. Whereas with a, with a posterior inguinal wall weakness, a, a sportsman's hernia, it tends to be a sort of slower, insidious onset with pain in the region gradually coming on, maybe feeling it some days, not on others, maybe with certain activities, not with others. Um, and often you can sort of continue your activities or you modify your activities a little bit or you compensate for it. And it comes on over time and, and gradually builds up, and gets worse and worse and worse. Um, I have to say though, I've seen it happen both ways as well. So you can get you can get strains where there's a weakness and it gradually gets worse and worse and worse until it comes on. Um, and it can be more chronic and sort of lead into a tendinopathy. But equally, you can get um, an acute incident which sort of um, brings the, the, the hernia to light. Um, but I think it's often on a background of some symptoms which may not be bothering too much. Um, in terms of the sort of activities, they're quite similar. We, we tend to see it in um, activities in sports where there's a lot of turning, twisting, sharp changes of direction, maybe stretching um, movements. Um, a lot of twisting is definitely the key. Um, and then in terms of how you manage the management, I, it, it is quite similar, um, but it has to be targeted at the right, right area. So, Generally, it's relative rest and the right sort of rehabilitation uh, and exercises. And there is injection therapy that we can, we can do, which can help um, the healing process and help with certain pain generators to allow uh, the rehab to be done properly. Um, but yeah, that's the, the sort of key differences or similarities, I would say, between them. And again, I, I think I'd emphasize there's a lot of um, crossover and there's a lot of pathologies that can coexist. So it's always uh, important to be aware of that in, in, uh, in your diagnosis and management. It can be, yes, most definitely. So back pain can definitely radiate into the growing area. Uh, and it tends to be back pain from um, a disc problem. So uh, the discs are in between the vertebral bodies of, of the spine uh, and they, they help cushioning and uh, protect the spine. But what can happen is that um, what's known as a slip disc or a pro prolapse disc, or I like the term uh, disc bulge because that's generally how I see it happening. There's a small area of the disc that bulges and when that happens, that physical uh, bulge or the chemicals that are released because of that bulge can irritate um, the nerve roots that come out. Um, and the nerves come out from the spinal cord and then they supply um, your lower limbs. And then if, if it's at a level where uh, it correlates to the hip and groin area, then that can certainly mimic uh, groin pain. And it's one of the things in the assess assessment that's quite important to do. Uh, is to, to assess the back and in the history, ascertain if there's a history of back problems or associated back pain, to see if there's a link there. Uh, and often in, when you are investigating the hip and the groin, uh, you will have also investigate the lumbar spine uh, to see if there's any contribution coming from there. And, and like I mentioned earlier, there's that possibility that can coexist. So you could have some symptoms coming from a back problem and some uh, from the hip or the groin itself. Um, the, the other thing um, to be aware of is the actual hip joint itself. So um, when we're talking about the groin and strains and hernias, we need to think about the hip joint itself and whether there's any pathology within the joint. Um, and this can be something like uh, a lesion of a, of a, of a, um, uh, a part of the hip called the labrum, which helps add stability to the hip. Uh, sometimes tears of this can contribute to hip and groin pain. Uh, sometimes there's a, there's, a, there's a problem within the hip shape. Um, so it's called femoral acetabular impingement, where the, the ball of the ball and socket joint can become um, sort of 
a change in the shape. There's increased bone uh, laid down around it. There's a change in the in the, the socket part of the hip and socket joint, hip uh, joint, and that becomes like a pincer. Uh, and this leads to reduced mobility within the hip, and that reduced mobility can then um, impact on the muscles around the hip and the nerves around the hip and the groin area. And often again, you see this as a sort of coexisting or maybe a continuum where there's a problem with the hip joint, that it can lead to problems with the adductor muscles and the uh, adductor origin and where it connects. It can cause problems in the, in the anterior aspect of the pelvis and the, the joint at the front called the pubic symphysis. And it can also be linked to a, a sportsman's or a sports hernia. Um, so all of these things can coexist, uh, can be linked, uh, and hip joints are very important to look out for. There can be osteoarthritis in the hip, there can be um, developmental problems causing dysplasia. There's a lot of things with the joint itself that need to be considered, as well as the lumbar spine and the actual hip and groin itself. I mentioned this or alluded to it earlier. So in terms of uh, strain, muscle strain, uh, the main treatment would be relative rest and physiotherapy to do the right rehabilitation and the right exercises, not only to, to heal the muscle and strengthen the muscle that's been injured, but also to strengthen the various muscles around uh, that muscle and around the hip, the groin, uh, the lower back um, and the lower abdomen, because Often, if one muscle is strained, there's, a, there's probably an underlying uh, weakness or imbalance. So this is really important to be corrected. Um, the, sometimes we can offer injection therapy as well, especially if uh, the muscle injury is quite severe. Um, so when you assess the muscle injury and you do the right investigations, whether that be an ultrasound scan or an MRI scan, we can grade the level of the injury, and that gives us an idea on uh, the severity of it and how long it's going to take to heal and um, whether any intervention is needed. Um, so that together with what the patient presents with and what we're finding on examination can determine what we're going to do. So in terms of injection therapy, um, I, I, I would um, recommend uh, something like, like PRP, so an orthobiologic, which is uh, basically your, um, it's called platelet-rich plasma. So it's taking your blood, a sample of your blood, putting it in a machine, and spinning it down to take uh, the platelets, which are the healing cells of the body, and injecting that directly into the site of the injury can promote healing um, from the injection itself, but also signals to the body to send more healing cells to that area. Um, so this is a really good therapy, which is safe, uh, it's very natural, and there's good evidence, and certainly in my experience, that this works well, if appropriate for this injury. Um, so that's a good option for muscle healing. There's also always to consider nutrition and lifestyles, and nutrition, it's really important to think about the, um, the anti-inflammatory foods which will promote healing and to, to these are foods that are rich in omega-3 and to avoid foods that are high in omega-6, which is the sort of pro-inflammatory uh, component. Uh, and then in terms of a, a sports hernia, a posterior inguinal wall weakness, again, treatment is similar with relative rest and um, again, the right sort of physiotherapy and rehabilitation. Um, but it's very important to pick out what the pain generators are. And sometimes if the pain generator is coming from the adductor origin or the pubic symphysis, then we can do an injection for that area. Um, if the rehab is not working, so the key is to sort of break the pain cycle and allow rehabilitation. But if after a period of rehabilitation, things are not progressing as we would want, or we think that the symptoms are too severe, then we would consider uh, a surgical repair. Uh, and the one that I would advocate is a minimal repair where uh, the surgeon will um, 
add some stitches just to reinforce and strengthen that posterior wall. And they will look at the nerves passing through the canal and see if there's any damage to those nerves or any inflammation around those nerves. And sometimes they will do a procedure where they uh, remove the damaged part of the nerve. So they denervate the area and that can uh, take the pain away really well and then allow uh, fuller rehabilitation following on from that. So I, I think um, from what I've said and I've spoken about, um, I would suggest seeing a doctor quite early on because there's so many things that we can do and help with, whether it is a strain, whether there's uh, a posterior inguinal wall weakness, whether there's a hip joint problem, whether there's a lumbar spine problem. And the key thing is uh, picking out what is the main pain generator because as, I, as I've said, I think quite a few times that um, often pathologies coexist and, and often it's a continuum and we'll see problems with the adductor and the adductor tendon and the muscle and then that moves and then it starts becoming a problem with the posterior inguinal wall and there might be a background problem of a hip joint issue there. Um, and the key thing I think with seeing a sports physician is to, to find out what is causing the problem and how we can um, manage that problem together and make sure the patient is able to get back to full function, whether it's um, high level sports, whether it's uh, physical activity, whether it's their work which requires physical activity. So it's really important that um, a patient isn't prevented from doing their normal levels of activity in the long term. And the way to ensure that is, is making sure you get the right diagnosis, doing the right treatment, the right rehabilitation, and preventing the recurrence as well, because that's key. You don't want to pick up an injury and then rest for a couple of weeks and then go straight back into it and then pick up the same injury again, make it worse, become chronic. And there's a lot of different things that we can offer um, and take a real sort of holistic view of it and, and look at whether there's issues further down uh, in the knee and the ankle contributing to this or higher up uh, and how we can uh, address those issues. And again, looking at the lifestyle, the nutrition, the diet, any supplements that may help with the healing. So it is a real sort of looking at the bigger picture uh, and making sure that we don't get recurrences and we don't get chronic pain situations.